Hello, welcome to today's event. Before we begin, we just wanted to let you all know to please submit all of your questions uh, as they arrive via the Q&A function below. All audience questions will be answered after the panel discussion during the Q&A session. In case you have to hop off early or are joining us late, this event is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on our YouTube channel. Live captioning will be provided during the event and the event recording will be captioned with a transcription of the event. Without further ado, I will pass it to Workers Rights Institute Executive Director, Mark Gaston Pierce. Thank you, Nick. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Gaston Pierce, Executive Director of the Workers Rights Institute at Georgetown Law School. As we have witnessed with excitement, re recent major union victories uh, are happening. WRI is thrilled to present Union Strong Coffee, a panel discussion on the Starbucks organizing campaign. Since December 2021, the first Starbucks Union victory in Buffalo uh, was sparked, <clears throat> has sparked a wave of organizing efforts among Starbucks workers in over 100 locations across 26 states. Starbucks workers are organizing for a stronger voice to resolve issues that include chronic understaffing, poor training for new partners, and a lack of fair compensation for their work. In response, Starbucks has gone to great lengths to staff or defeat the unionization efforts at its stores through tactics such as captive audience speeches and deploying corporate executives to intimidate workers. For, Spar for Starbucks workers, teams of lawyers have been actively working to protect organizing efforts and an array of resources in their legal to toolkits. Much of this ongoing organization has been led primarily by enthusiastic and energetic workers who like the workers at Amazon may well be the face of a reinvigorated labor movement in this country. Moderating this discussion is journalist Braden Campbell. Braden is a labor journalist at Law 360s whose article has appeared in its new its news periodical, The Employment Authority. His work has been featured in Boston.com and other pu publications. Braden reports on a variety of labor-related issues, as well as important decisions of the National Labor Relations Board and the Department of Labor. He has closely covered organizing for gig workers, Amazon workers, and Starbucks workers, and is sure to provide a very probative and informative dynamic to today's discussion. Welcome, Braden. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Pierce. I'm really uh, excited to be here and lead a discussion on this timely topic uh, with such a plugged in and knowledgeable group. Um, so I'll introduce the rest of uh, the panel now. We have uh, Ian Hayes, a partner at uh, Hayes Dolce. The, oh, I'm just making sure I wasn't muted, sorry. Uh, Ian Hayes is a labor and employment attorney based in Buffalo, New York. Uh, recently, he has represented the Starbucks Workers United campaign and coordinated the campaign's legal work. He regularly represents individuals and groups of workers in wage and hour litigation, representing employers in discrimination and harassment actions and representing employee benefit funds. He has extensive experience practicing at state and federal agencies, including the NLRB, the New York Public Employee Relations Board, uh, the EOC, and the New York Division of Human Rights. Uh, Ian has also represented clients in New York State's court, court system, including at the Courts of Appeals, as well as in federal court. Additionally, he has previously worked as an organizer for the Service Employees International Union. Uh, we have Marcus Don Pierce, who already spoke, but uh, is a visiting professor at the Executive Director of the Workers' Rights Institute at Georgetown University Law Center, uh, and a great source as well on uh, labor law developments. Uh, Mr. Pierce is a former board member and chairman of the National Labor Relations Board, uh, who served by appointment of President Barack Obama for two terms, including in August 2018. I began his career first as a field attorney uh, and later district trial specialist in the NLRB's regional offices. Uh, after entering private practice, Mr. Pierce co-founded the labor law firm of Creighton, Pierce, Johnson, and Giroux, 
Uh, Mr. Pierce has testified before Congress regarding labor matters and has lectured and given continuing legal education presentations before state and national bar associations, labor management organizations, and educational institutions throughout the country. Uh, Nat Baldino is a policy analyst with the Education, Labor, and Worker Justice Team at CLASP, an anti-poverty nonprofit, where he focuses on paid family and medical leave, paid sick days, fair scheduling, labor standards implementation and enforcement, and giving lived experience a voice in labor policy. He provides policy analysis and technical assistance for state and local agencies and advocates, including worker centers, unions, and community-based organizations. Prior to joining CLASP, Mr. Baldino worked as a barista in a coffee shop in DC, and he partnered with local grassroots organizations to organize workers in service industries paying low wages, focusing specifically on small businesses within the coffee industry. Uh, and we have as well Casey Moore, who's a Starbucks barista at the Williamsville Place Starbucks in Buffalo, New York, and a member of the Starbucks Workers United Organizing Committee. Uh, Casey originally joined the organizing efforts at Buffalo or at Starbucks in late August after being approached by a coworker in Buffalo. As the campaign has grown, she has been a leader of the National Communications and Social Media Committee. She has also helped fellow Starbucks workers around the country launch organizing efforts at their own stores. She is passionate about building a democratic workplace and gaining a voice at the bargaining table for her and her coworkers. She is excited to work with thousands of other Starbucks workers across the country to grow the labor movement and hold Starbucks accountable for their aggressive anti-union campaign. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Um, and I will get into uh, some questions here. Uh, so uh, the recent worker-led unionization at Starbucks has drawn overwhelming attention on the company and its workers. It's no secret that these efforts have likely been long in the making. Uh, Mr. Hayes, Ms. Moore, uh, how long ago did Starbucks workers begin to realistically talk about organizing and what were the core motivations? Um, so I think, you know, that, that question is, well, first of all, Thanks everyone for having me. It's a real honor um, and it's great to be here. I think that question is probably better uh, for Casey to answer as, as one of the workers actually involved in the campaign. If I may though, just sort of along those lines as someone who's kind of an insider and kind of an outsider in the campaign um, because I'm, I've never been a Starbucks worker, um, but I've been involved in the labor movement for about 15 years and I, I just want to observe that um, even from the inside, it's clear that the campaign is truly organic and led by workers. So I think that is going to, I mean, maybe that's the start of the answer, not, maybe not. Um, but I just wanted to sort of, I think it's appropriate to frame it that way um, rather than as something that just sort of was a project started by a giant union from the top down. It was, it's, literally coming from the opposite direction. But I don't know, Casey, what do you think? Well, I would still give you some credit, Ian. You're one of our, this is being recorded, so I won't say favorite lawyer, but like wink, wink. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so we started, um, like Ian said, it definitely was something that, you know, we started here in Buffalo that we had no idea it would turn into the national kind of movement that it's become. Um, I think, I actually have, uh, so uh, workers in um, Buffalo in 2019 at Spot Coffee, and I actually have some of their coffee now, um, they organized with Workers United. And I think a lot of Starbucks workers like myself were inspired by their efforts, um, especially working throughout the pandemic. We thought, why can't we do that? Um, I was approached by a coworker actually who was saying this is happening. Um, and we kind of all started organizing at once. Um, in late August, we all wrote a letter to the former CEO, Kevin Johnson, um, announcing our attention to organize. Um, and since then we've now won five unionized Starbucks stores in Buffalo. Um, we have another vote count happening tomorrow. Um, and now there's over 180 stores that have filed petitions across the country in 28 states and 10 out of 11 stores have successfully voted to unionize. Thanks. Um, and organizing any workplace is difficult, uh, especially in environments like coffee shops, uh, where the history with unionizing is new and a few and few efforts have recently succeeded. Uh, with organizing coffee shops in particular, what are some unique aspects of the workplace that might make it uh, more challenging to unionize? And how does that affect the ability of those efforts to maintain uh, legal protection, possibly again for Mr. Hayes or Ms. Moore? Ms. Moore. Yeah, I think, um, so I can, I can answer that because I actually represent Workers United who, who has really been at the forefront of organizing coffee shops. Like Casey just said, they organized Spot Coffee. And before that, they organized Gimme Coffee in Ithaca. 
Um, and I can sort of speak from that experience rather than Starbucks. What, what makes organizing Starbucks difficult is the company terrorizing and coercing its own workforce for the last eight months. So that's unique to Starbucks so far. Um, for other coffee shops, I mean, I think I'll just make the general observation that there does tend to be at least some level of turnover and that sort of makes it easier for, and this varies of course by employer, but that makes it in my experience easier for an employer to see cracks in the solidarity of the workforce at, at a given shop. And in the last few years, it, there's been a real surge of employers using rules that uh, the Trump appointees at the NLRB put in place having to do with decertification elections. Um, so I, I raise that because I mean, this is an, a matter of public record that has happened at Gimme Coffee. Um, I guess I won't speak specifically to the employer's involvement, but I feel comfortable saying the employer exploited the process that was started by a worker who was no longer involved in the process soon after filing a petition. Um, and that case is still going on within the NLRB's structure. Uh, so short answer, turnover allows, at least as of right now under the board's rules, allows for something like decertification or just undermining the solidarity of the workforce as a whole. Yeah, that's totally right. And I would just add to Ian's point, you know, Starbucks has done everything that they can. They've thrown everything that can at us to try to crush this effort. Um, as Ian said, some of our stores, my store, it's about 20 people that work there. The Walden and Anderson store, which they closed down and turned into a training center for months on end. Um, they had about 20 partners or so that were originally on that voter list that should have been on the voter list over 40 people were eligible to vote for that election. So they've just been stuffing people into these stores, over hiring, and then cutting the hours of the people who started the organizing effort in an attempt to get them out. And now they're doing this nationwide. There's folks that um, petitioned and, and wanted to have their union election months and months ago and are still waiting because Starbucks has repeatedly called to question the what the bargaining unit can be, even though the NLRB has ruled countless times now that a single store is an appropriate bargaining unit. And we're still having the same question. My store just had to go through that last week. This was now the third time that this has happened, just in third or fourth, Ian, and just in Buffalo alone. Um, so just like the, the constant delays um, and then all of the things that Starbucks are able to do in the meantime. We just had a, I was just at a picket this morning because they fired yet another union leader. This was just the second here in Buffalo in one week. They just fired two more people in Kansas City. Um, so it's, it's, they're getting desperate and it's, um, it's scaring a lot of people as well. Got it. And I believe uh, uh, Mr. Baldino had something to add to. Uh, yeah, I would just say, you know, ditto to everything. Uh, that my colleagues said, but I also think that for the coffee industry more general, I think it's also really important to think of culturally what coffee shops represent, like big corporations, but also, you know, the little guys as well. Coffee shops are often seen as like this third space and are this now this artisanal thing with, you know, the wave that Starbucks really started. And I think that actually one of the big things for the coffee shop industry is that we can use things that are typically seen that are being used against workers are actually some of workers biggest strengths so the fact that you know a lot of these companies build their brands on progressive values on the sort of you know progressive cultural thing but they aren't actually upholding any of those values that's something that the workers themselves came to the companies because they believe in those values and you know the danger when you hire people who believe in the thing that you espouse even when you don't believe it is that they continue to believe it and then will use it against you so i think that that's a really valuable thing because you know starbucks is a company but it's also a brand all of the little guys like the place i worked for they're also brands that are tied to you know marketing for grocery stores where they can lose money um, I think it's a really big thing to think of coffee in this like cultural context for organizing. 
Right, thanks for those points. I'm here another one for uh, Ms. Moore. Uh, the campaign to unionize Starbucks comes alongside another big campaign, the Amazon, uh, where a grassroots union just won an election that I think shocked a lot of uh, labor observers. Like your campaign, theirs was led by workers. But what is the success of these campaigns, yours and the ALUs, uh, say about this approach? Yeah, absolutely. And we are so excited. We had the Staten Island win in Amazon the same day as the roastery in New York City. So we were so beyond excited for those workers and we stand in solidarity with them. So it's incredible. Um, and I think it shows, you know, I think, you know, this is my first experience in the labor movement, but, you know, I think people, the service industry has been ignored for so long. And, you know, especially younger people, people who we don't see great economic prospects. Like we worked during the pandemic. Um, we, we don't deserve, we don't have the pay that we deserve, the working conditions, the respect, the dignity. So I think, you know, we're turning to unions as the answer to that. And I think a lot of people are learning that, hey, the will is here. We can absolutely do this together. Um, and we can succeed and we're succeeding all across the country and we're winning big. Um, and, you know, it's great that we have Workers United that's that's behind us as well. But I think, as you said, it goes to show that when the people that in the stores that we know what how to make our workplaces better and we have the power to do so as long as we stick together. So, um, yeah, I hope that our movements and can inspire other people in the service industry to organize as well. There's no reason. Um, Wendy's, McDonald's, all these other places um, can't organize their workplaces just like we did. Yeah, and I think certainly there has been some inspiration there. I talked to some organizers of ALU on Friday who invoked your campaign. There's actually a, a guy there who I don't believe was a Starbucks worker, but was wearing a Starbucks Workers United shirt at their Norby's office outside the vote count. So uh, the word is spreading. Um, so was the, there was some discussion earlier about sort of the, the responses uh, Starbucks has had to uh, the campaigns that's gone on, but uh, for Mr. Hayes, um, you know, what are the sort of legal actions uh, workers can take in response to sort of tactics, you know, uh, Starbucks and putting to use to respond to these campaigns? So, all right, um, yeah, the company's response has been essentially from the day that the campaign went public to wage, you know, an outright war against its own employees in the form of, of a very fierce anti-union campaign. Um, and, you know, this is being recorded. I'm sure Starbucks lawyers would love to sue me or Casey or somebody else uh, for defamation. I'm not going to say that they violated the law. Um, I can go through, though, uh, all of the allegations the company has made against the company, uh, or the union has made against the company since the start of the campaign. Um, we've filed over 70 unfair labor practice charges against the company uh, starting in, I believe, November of last year. Um, roughly half of those have to do with conduct in Buffalo. So let me just briefly go through that. Um, we're alleging that there's been, well, first of all, that the company closed stores either uh, temporarily or permanently in response to the campaign. And, and this is all in, we allege in order to dissuade people from unionizing. They've closed stores, they've engaged in massive surveillance, including by engaging in some pretty bizarre activity where these really high level Starbucks executives moved to Buffalo, New York, uh, and are, are, I think some of them are still living in hotels here. Um, and have just sort of gone into stores talking to workers um, as if that's normal. Of course, it's not normal, and that's the point, is to show we're paying attention and we don't like what you're doing. Um, the we allege the company has also solicited grievances from workers that they've promised and granted benefits. Um, they've, they've engaged in threats of reprisals. They also have rules in their handbook that uh, we believe uh, violate uh, federal labor law. Um, and all of that is sort of the first phase of the anti-union campaign. More recently, the, the company has really started to ramp things up and is, is disciplining workers more than it was in the past. Um, sometimes that involves uh, enforcing policies that are on the books that they never used to enforce. Sometimes it involves creating new policies, um, but the general strategy appears to create 
massive disruption across the country, um, particularly in stores where there's union activity, where workers are trying to organize or already have filed a petition through the NLRB, um, and to enforce those rules in a discriminatory way against pro-union workers. And, and not just pro-union workers who, for example, wear a union pin or put their name on a letter to management, but really the, the in particular, they're targeting the leaders of the campaign, uh, people who have, you know, not only organized their store, but maybe Casey can talk about this at some point, but like part of the, if you want to call it a model, <clears throat> excuse me, here is workers from one place, Starbucks workers from one place in the country, talking to workers from an entirely different place, you know, across the country about how to organize. So leaders like that are being disciplined and terminated um, at an accelerating rate, um, particularly just in the last couple of weeks, that's, that's become far worse. Um, the company doesn't care apparently about, you know, how that looks. Um, to the public, they care about how it looks more to the workers. They want to scare people. Um, they want to win these campaigns. They don't care if that involves violating the law. Um, and I guess it, it's we have yet to see how bad that's going to get. Um, and I think it's not going to stop until there's widespread public outrage over that in a sustained um, and really explicit way. Anyway, to get uh, sorry to get back to the the unfair labor practices that we're alleging, just briefly, and then I'll stop. Um, we've alleged nationally that the company has cut hours across all stores. Um, again, for those same purposes, um, and we're seeking a, a whole host of remedies that are currently there available under the law. And in addition to that, remedies that the NLRB's general counsel has signaled, you know, haven't been used in the past, but she's willing to pursue. Um, those remedies include, you know, broad cease and desist orders to basically stop the entire anti-union campaign, um, bargaining orders at stores where the anti-union campaign has caused the workers to vote no, that, as Casey mentioned, has only happened in one store, but we're seeking that as a remedy. And just generally, we're seeking 10J injunctive relief under the National Labor Relations Act uh, for all of this activity in, in Buffalo and for the most part nationally. So sorry, that was a lot of information, but the, the unfair labor practice case is pretty huge. It, it will probably be a milestone in labor law uh, once it sort of makes, all of it makes its way through the NLRB infrastructure, um, but that's where we are right now. Definitely. And, you know, Mr. Pierce is a you know, board veteran, you know, first as as worker and then as you know, one of the leaders there. Um, you know, can you speak to some of that? I mean, what are what are some things that, you know, the National Board, National Labor Relations Board can do um, you know, to intervene to protect Starbucks workers from undue intimidation and other tactics as this campaign goes on? Well, the board is there primarily to uh, enforce and investigate unfair labor practices and uh, to uh, bring about uh, a atmosphere that will provide for uh, good laboratory conditions for, for, for organizing. Um, where the challenge, of course, is the protracted nature of, of the process. Uh, as compared to other agencies, the NLRB is fairly quick with its, its um, investigations. Uh, however, the investigations take 30 to 45, sometimes 50, 50 days, then they have to get <clears throat> um, pursued through uh, agenda plan, uh, plan, uh, complaint issues, a lit litigation follows, and before an administrative law judge who issues a decision, which is a recommendation to the board, which will invariably be challenged by the, the uh, Starbucks, uh, and then the board has to make a decision. All that is, uh, as I said, uh, a, a stretched out process because the NLRB does not have the ability to enforce its own orders. Uh, 
also the NLRB is struggling uh, because it was stripped of significant manpower, rather personnel, uh, during the prior administration. Uh, and it has been flat funded uh, this year uh, with appropriations. So consequently, the NLRB uh, would not, cannot move as fast as uh, organizers would want them to, or as fast as it should, given what uh, Ian has described as a barrage of unfair labor practices. Now, if I, if if you will, um, if I can, I'll talk about a 10J inject injective relief. Uh, Ian has indicated that the, that that's in pursuit. Um, I understand that there has been frustration with respect to how quickly that happens. Um, as you know, I sat on the board, I was chair under the, the Obama ad administration. We received uh, 10J requests from the general counsel and the full board had to vote on them and green, green light them before they could get, get pursued. For 10, and then of course, I was a field attorney in the Buffalo office. Uh, when, way back when, when all my hair was black. Uh, and pursuing uh, 10J injunctive relief in federal court involves being able to make a case before a district court judge that there is just and proper uh, basis for an injunction to take place. Um, and oftentimes that is, is not going to happen unless an admin. Uh, a district court judge gets a chance to see what's in a transcript. To, to, they're not going to, even though they had the discretion to do so, they generally are not going to be comfortable about issuing 10J injunctive relief without something more than just affidavits making assertions about what, what is taking place. Now, that being said, when you have something as pervasive as this going on, we do have a general counsel who is active in her pursuit of, of justice. And 10J will be pursued as expeditiously as possible by this general counsel as compared to who we had previously. But I can't say that there is warm comfort in the process just that the process will continue, continue and, the, and the investigation and pursuit of justice by the NLRB will not be tainted by any kind of bias in, in any fashion. Uh, and this is all, of course, against the backdrop of you know, the National Labor Relations Act and labor law as it currently stands. You have some proposals to make some changes uh, through the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, as well as you know, the Build Back Better uh, plan would have uh, it, it enacted some changes to labor law as well. Uh, Mr. Baldino, can you speak to sort of some of the proposals that are out there and their status for in how they may have impacted a campaign like this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, some big things that could have happened was, you know, a better, better investment in Build Back Better if um, the PRO Act was more invested in, especially um, thinking of how looking at the Starbucks campaign can help set a floor for everyone else in the industry, really thinking through that and investing in the pro X um, fines, you know, even though Starbucks won't really care that much about fines, you know, cause they're so big that would really deter other smaller players in the industry. Um, but the other thing that I would say, the bigger thing that Congress could actually do besides uh, investing more, uh, as Mark was saying, in uh, reinvesting in the uh, National Labor Relations Board, is that uh, Congress should right now be looking at what's happening at Starbucks and at Amazon and see them as these big, large rank and file movements for what they are that are worker centered and recognize that workers are the experts of their workplace and listen to those demands. And, you know, because of the power dynamic of labor itself, workers are always going to need a union, no matter how good things get, right? Workers can always need a union and use a union. 
but workers shouldn't necessarily have to unionize to get things like paid leave, paid sick days, a living wage and health care, things like that. And with something like health care, for example, that's often a main reason that deters workers from being able to organize because we hear workers terrified to lose the benefit that they need. Starbucks has allegedly been doing that to uh, workers already uh, through firing them, they lose their health care, um, cutting hours as a union busting tactic, keeping workers from having health care. So addressing health care issues through uh, things like the Striking Workers Health Care Protection Act is a way to listen to what workers are saying and what they need and recognize the power disparities that are at play. And just more generally, instead of reacting long after rank and file has already done all of the work and you know gotten what they need to get that Congress isn't getting them, if Congress wants to demonstrate that they do hear workers, they should be proactively addressing workers' needs. And that isn't just through you know the typical labor laws that we see, but that's also through health care, through fair housing protections, through addressing, you know, redlining and housing discrimination so workers don't have to commute an hour each way to get to their jobs because they're priced out of a city, student loan forgiveness, anything that a worker would worry about not being able to take care of if they went on strike or were retaliated against or lost a union battle, Congress members should be thinking about before the union already comes into existence. And Braden, if I can add Go to, ahead. to Nat, Nat's excellent um, response, is that if, if the federal government can't take the weight or because uh, Congr Congress doesn't have the appetite, and parenthetically, there has not been a worker strengthened, strengthened piece of legislation uh, related to the National Labor Relations Act since its passage, uh, even though there have been dozens of attempts. But if the federal government can't take the weight then we'll have to look at the states. Um, you, you can look at what, what's happening in New York State with, with just cause being enacted for, for, for certain classifications of, of employ, employees. Uh, movements could go in that direction in different jurisdictions where, where even if workers are, are not unionized and don't have a contract to file a grievance, they can be uh, in a position to make arguments that their terminations were not with uh, uh, was it, uh, were, were not justly done so, and there'd be a process for, for, for workers to be protected, which workers can rally around and organizations and unions could rally around as they're trying to organize the workforce. Thanks. And, you know, we've heard a lot, you know, now about the kind of protracted nature of the board's practice often. Um, Ms. Moore, uh, between the filing for unionization and the union election yourself, which can take, you know, as I've been pointing out, weeks to months and has in this case, you know, how, how did you sustain momentum? How can you sustain momentum with your fellow partners and withstand the sorts of tactics uh, Starbucks is using to dissuade unionization? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... You know, I think the the greatest thing is sticking together across the country. Um, as I was saying before, we now have committees that are popping up um, in 28 different states. So we've been able to um, share strategies, share ways to, to keep our heads up. And also the victories that we've been having have also been a great um, push in the momentum of what we can do. And we're well aware that um, you know, we get stronger with every store that files and fundamentally we're fighting for the right to organize. Um, we've asked Starbucks, um, we've asked Kevin Johnson and now, um, sorry, excuse me. Um, and now uh, interim CEO Howard Schultz um, to sign the fair election principles. We have not received a response from them on that, um, but we're fundamentally fighting for our right to organize and we'll continue to fight for that. Um, so we know that with every victory that we get stronger. Um, but it is, I won't lie, it is It is the question. We've been hosting rallies and pickets in any way to kind of call attention to what Starbucks is doing. But especially as Ian was saying in the past few weeks, Howard Schultz is really the architect of their anti-union campaign. And with him returning, things have only um, been getting worse. Their, their desire is to scare us um, and they're doing everything in their power to try to prevent people from organizing um, yeah, as, as both Nate and Ian were saying, the cutting of the hours is especially 
horrific just because even at my store, I have a partner that was scheduled one day a week. You can't pay rent on that. You can't buy groceries on that. You can't afford healthcare or any of these things. So they're attacking people's livelihoods. They're attacking their jobs. Um, they've displayed no right, no respect for the right to organize at all. Thanks, Ms. Moore. And, oh, oh, go ahead. Now, it, while, it's, while it's of minimal comfort, my recommendation is that these unfair labor practice charges need to be supplemented on a regular basis every time a violation of the act takes place and that the regional offices be loaded to the point of overload with unfair labor practice charges. It's very easy for this deluge of, of unfair labor practices for some of them to be feel, uh, there may be a feeling that they're cumulative and, and maybe it'll be uh, 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 assumed into some broader charge. File the charges, file them individually sometimes because regrettably appropriations for the agency is determined by the activities that, that take place. The last administration argued that they didn't need as much money as needed to be for the agency to function properly. And uh, the Congress looks to the amount of charges that get processed to make a determination as to whether or not an agency should get its funding. I know, having been an investigator and a litigator, not only within the agency, but uh, practicing before the agency, that the devil is in the de details. A lot of these cases cannot get done quickly enough if you do not have the personnel and the budget in order to have it done. So that's that that's a FYI. Thanks. We have a few more minutes of uh, direct questioning for me before we go to the Q&A from the audience. Just a reminder to the audience, if you could drop your questions uh, in the Q&A, in the chat, and we'll get to those in a few minutes, but I have a couple more questions for the panel before we open that up. Uh, so Ms. Moore, one notable aspect of the Starbucks unionization efforts is that you know, it's largely been driven by young millennial and, and Gen Z workers. And that's also the case with uh, the Amazon campaign. You know, if these efforts continue to succeed for workers, you know, what does that imply for the future of the labor movement? I'll steal um, our advisor, Richard, Richard Bensinger, he's called us Generation Union, which um, not only includes uh, millennials and Gen Z, but really we have people from all different ages. I think, you know, the majority of people that I work with are maybe in their 20s or teens even, but, you know, there are folks from all ages. And I think Generation Union really sums up that this is a resurgence in the labor movement more broadly. Um, you know, as Nate pointed out, this is a lot of these companies were in an age where people are concerned about climate change and global warming and all of these things. And you have Starbucks, which professes to be a progressive company saying that they care about things like sustainability. Well, you can't be pro LGBTQ rights, pro, pro Black Lives Matter, pro sustainability and be anti-union. It doesn't work that way. So I think what you're seeing is people seeing that there's vast income inequality, the, the economy where we're ruining our environment. Um, so I think people are really turning to unions as a way to express our collective power um, and fight for all of these things that we care about. Um, you know, we wanna fight for sustainability issues in our contract. We wanna fight for wages and all of that too, but we also wanna fight um, to make our environment and our communities better. So I think it just is going to show that um, people are saying enough is enough. <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, you had Howard Schultz himself come to Buffalo and I kid you not, the words, the crisis of capitalism came out of that man's mouth. And it's just showing, yeah. Um, you know, it's not cool to be a white man billionaire anymore coming to tell hourly wage workers that how dare you ask for more because we've thought to give you healthcare and ASU tuition. So be happy with that. It's just, that's not enough. Um, anymore, and people are demanding a democratic workplace, a seat at the table. 
Got it. And, you know, Mr. Pierce, as these efforts uh, continue to unfold, you know, do the developments or practices within the Starbucks unionization drive present any, you know, new legal questions or challenges for the NLRB as it administers union elections in the 21st century? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, the challenge that, that uh, has been experienced at Starbucks is not a, a unique one in that um, in, in retail facilities, um, there has always been a way that employers can manipulate the bargaining unit and, and load it up. You, you saw it not only in Starbucks, but you saw it in, in Amazon at the Bessemer facility. I think that uh, what has been done under at the time that I was chair is to provide opportunities for the process to go quick, quicker or more streamlined by uh, having administrative processes that don't necessarily need to be done prior to an election be put to periods after the election has, has been held. So the, the new election rules that were put together in 2014 uh, accomplished that to a limited extent. And I say limited because as soon as the Republican administration came in, they tried to roll it back. They didn't roll it back completely because um, they did it wrong and, and a district court judge struck it down. However, the, the, those processes remain a challenge. The pandemic has been an education for the, the NLRB as well. Um, I think the NLRB got a little bit more practice and, and achieved, achieved a little bit more of a comfort zone with respect to mail ba ballot elections. Uh, the ability, however, for the NLRB to convert over to electronic voting or processes that will provide less opportunity for the employer to manipulate and interfere uh, is, is, um, is essentially denied because for the, for the last decade or more, there have been riders on appropriations bills saying that the NLRB cannot engage in rulemaking that would include electronic voting. Now that's clearly purely an anti-union rider because as you might know, in the airline and the railway industry, electronic voting is commonplace. So, so to the, deny it on, in the private sector, one has to wonder, well, what, what, what is the motivation? Um, <clears throat> the board is doing its best at, at the regional level to address camp campaigns <clears throat> because it is clear that post-pandemic, post-George Floyd, post-Me um, uh, Too, post a lot of social justice and environmental issues, workers are being more activated. And the economy is such that workers at these um, facilities and, and businesses that heretofore were workers that leave quickly are staying and being activated and pursuing uh, rights under the National Labor Relations Act. Great. Now we're going to move on to the audience Q&A for about you know, the last 15 minutes of this year. So the first question uh, is what will be the strategy for collective bargaining for the stores that unionized? Uh, will the union seek coordinated bargaining or proposing identical, identical terms and conditions for each location? I can speak to bargaining a little bit. Um, so right now, Elmwood was the first store up here in Buffalo that um, won and started the bargaining process soon to be followed by Genesee Street and now uh, stores in Mesa, Knoxville and Seattle. And as we know, there's just gonna be more and more vote counts coming up and people joining them. Um, uh, I would say that 
uh, the Elmwood partners uh, are forming a bargaining committee of partners that are at that store. And what's been happening is people have been joining that bargaining committee once they've won. And so the Littler Mendelssohn lawyer that is representing Starbucks at the table asked at one point, oh, what? So you're just going to keep joining, having people join your bargaining committee? And we said, yes, that's it's called a movement. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are absolutely, you know, talking to each other across the country. Um, there, are, of course, I'm sure demands that are universal to working at Starbucks, um, things like seniority pay, credit card tipping, health and safety policies, but there's also regional differences as well that we intend to bargain for. Um, so right now, uh, I'll let Ian speak to the legal side of things, but we are absolutely fighting for uh, some of the core things that we want um, in all of our contracts, such as Starbucks to sign the fair election principles um, and things of that nature. But I'll let Ian speak to Starbucks's legal strategy. Well, no, I, I think that covers it with respect to bargaining because, you know, the law, maybe this is the wrong place to say it, but the law is not going to help us out on this issue um, if the company insists on bargaining uh, individually with each store that wins an election, even if that's 3,000 stores, um, the current state of the law isn't, you know, really going to help us out. So uh, that's going to change because of a cultural shift or public pressure, um, or just, you know, Starbucks sort of waking up and listening to its own workers and doing the right thing. Got it. And you know, Ms. Moore kind of already addressed this a bit, but maybe you can elaborate a bit. Um, what are the workplace issues you believe you can now fix now that you have uh, these unions growing? Yeah, I mean, I think our fundamental um, issue is really having a say in our workplace, not just now to address issues that exist now, but months, years down the line when there's not an active organizing campaign because we want a say in what those conditions are um, for those who come after us even as well. Um, but definitely working through the pandemic, um, there's been a lot of concern about health and safety, um, wanting better protections for workers. Um, Starbucks didn't have any seniority pay previous to our union campaign um, here in Buffalo. Right before folks voted at the first set of stores in Buffalo, Starbucks announced um, a very small seniority pay increase that wasn't really followed through with. Um, so that's something that we absolutely wanna fight for. We have a partner here, Michelle Eisen, who's one of the leaders of the campaign, has been a partner at Starbucks for 11 years and makes barely a dollar more than someone who starts today. Um, so the list goes on and on really with the things that, um, that we can bargain for. And I think another big one is just accountability with management. Um, the amount of people that work in a store that have to hide in the back room when a customer who is harassing them um, and the company does nothing about that and we have no um, way to challenge that. And also as we're seeing with the firings that we've brought up multiple times now, uh, just cause is something that we will absolutely be fighting for as well. Um, since it seems that Starbucks has no respect for um, respecting the rights of, of organizers in their stores. Got it. And this next one is uh, from Mr. Baldino or Mr. Hayes. Um, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages to organizing on a store by store basis? Um, and what legal challenges does that present you know, from the workers end? Um, I, I, I'll answer the legal part, which is, you know, um, I could go on and on about this, but I'll try to keep it limited. The, the legal challenge is something that Professor Pierce alluded to a couple of minutes ago, um, which is that the, the legal process that exists at the NLRB right now has allowed the company to, each time workers file a petition at a store, to raise an identical legal issue that's already been decided many times, that's a, a losing argument. Um, every single time and that drags out the process by several weeks and as anyone who's involved in labor organizing knows every day uh, between the filing of a petition and the day a worker votes uh, is gold because that's the period when the the company can come down the hardest and try to coerce workers as starbucks has been doing so you know gaining weeks from the process because of their technical ability to lead, to raise a legal issue um, has just been a huge boon for the company. Um, and 
so far, the NLRB has not stopped them from doing that. Um, for you know, the, sort of the the law students uh, on on this or watching this, uh, in other words, we're really not operating. Uh, with any kind of principle of res judicata or issue preclusion, the company can just raise the same issue every time, which creates a system where if an employer is willing to spend literally hundreds of thousands, if not probably millions of dollars paying lawyers to do that, to go into NLRB hearings, literally to waste time, uh, they're allowed to do that, and, and it fundamentally shifts the dynamic of the whole campaign. Um, and it certainly eliminates workers' ability to vote in what the, the board calls laboratory conditions, where you're supposed to be able to make a neutral decision about whether you want a union. Uh, and those conditions have been destroyed so systematically in this case that, uh, you know, it's a, a joke. Um, anyway, that, that's kind of the legal procedural issue that comes up with organizing single store units. And I, I'll just say it's an issue that needs to be fixed. Um, you know, certainly the NLRB can engage in rulemaking. I hope they do that soon. Um, but, you know, beyond that, uh, we, we live in a world where there are many chain, giant corporate chains like Starbucks uh, and because of the historical trend that we're talking about, where uh, younger workers or just workers who have who have gotten the rawest end of our cultural deal uh, are are waking up and organizing, um, this issue is going to happen more and more. There are you know dozens of chains that everybody can rattle off the names of where this could happen. Uh, until the system is is fixed in that way. So anyway, I'll hand it off to Nat. Uh, Nat, before you before you answer, can I say something to dovetail onto what what Ian was saying? And because there there is an upside to the to this process with respect to retail chains, and and though small, that upside is there's a pres pre presumption under the National Labor Relations Act for the appropriateness of a single store unit. unit. And that helped the organizing campaign at Starbucks because you can have single store elections uh, without being concerned that the employer is going to stuff the ballot box with people from stores all over the region as they have attempted to do in each and every one of the hearings that that that, that uh, um, Ian has described. So that helps even though there's the struggle to have to litigate it each time. Uh, the advantage that the union has is that the case law is in their favor in that in that respect. Uh, yeah, I would have said uh, what Mark said, but without any of the legalese because I don't know it. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I think I think also in in a general power building sense, I think um, other uh, chains or franchises or whoever seeing individual stores organizing uh, in a power building sense, it's sometimes easier to be like, oh, well, they just did like my one store. I can organize, you know, my store of 10 workers or whatever. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, as Casey has said, uh, power is being built way outside of just singular stores. You know, this the Starbucks movement has centralized communication and everything. So I think even though they've, you know, decided to go piecemeal, it's ending up uh, I think it's still going to end up in their favor in that sense, in terms of the power that they've built. I'll just add to that, even when Starbucks loses the single store unit cases, they have said, don't worry about it. We're just going to close down stores for renovations that hadn't been scheduled, put all of these workers into this store, cut the workers hours who were actually in that store and then put all these people 
on the voter list. So even when they lose, they still try to find ways to get around that, which has also been fun. Not successful, but um, something else that they do as well. And I think we've got uh, time for one more question. This one is for Mr. Pearson, that he can you know, bring this to a close here. Um, dealing with an industry like coffee shops, where there has not been much historic precedent for labor organizing, uh, what unique legal challenges have been presented for the NLRB with Starbucks workers as they move to unionize? Well, unique is is unfortunately not not the characteristic that I would ha I would ascribe because. Um, uh, uh, prevalent unfair labor practices uh, engaged in by an employer that wants to keep out a bargaining unit is pretty much uh, uh, typical of, of what is to be expected when unions try, try to organize. Um, what would be uniquely favorable in this process is, is the ability for the public so many of whom like their cup of coffee in the morning to see what this this supposedly good guy this this environmentally conscious uh, progressive corporation does in response to their their employees trying to to, to organize and uh, and figure out well it it is time for a change in the in the labor law there needs to be a way in which labor law can be uh, or can be structured where workers have worker choice uninhibited by employer in, 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 interference, so you can get a true the true desires of workers to be effectuated. The organizers can tell you that they have to get an overabundance of of, of cards signed. Uh, because they know by the time an election comes to place, the anti-union campaign will be such, and and the intimidation tactics will be such that the support would decrease exponentially. Uh, also, it shines a light on 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 where the case law needs to go with respect to bargaining or orders in the face of unfair labor practice. Great. And I think that's um, about time we had for um, q and I want to kick back to you know, Mr. Pierce to you know, give some closing remarks. Before I do, I just want to say you know, thanks so much for you know, uh, giving me this opportunity and really enjoyed being part of this panel. And thanks so much to our you know, panelists for answering my questions. Well, I'd like to thank everybody, particularly those on this panel who have, have worked so hard to um, let us know everything that was going on in that Starbucks campaign. The efforts have been commendable, the passion behind it and the litigation skill of, of uh, Ian Hayes, who I'll have to give him a particular shout out because he's the offspring of my former law firm now doing his own thing, but, but uh, uh, praises to, to him and to the dedication of these Starbucks workers who articulated very interesting, insightful uh, information with regard to this, this campaign. And thanks to you, Braden, for moderating this event. And I am envious at your ability to speak as fast as you can, because I clearly can't. Um, and then a special thanks to, to Workers' Rights Institute research assistants, Nick Gonzalez and, and, and Sheva Seti for putting this whole event together. This was their idea. This was their package. And they found a, a great opportunity to show what kind of skills that they bring to the table in between their studies. So thanks again for all of this work. And this is my guest on Pierce, thanking you who attended uh, for this opportunity to share this great information. You have a good afternoon.